Jesus, and we ask you to draw our hearts and let us run together after you. Lord, draw us and let us run together after you. In the name of Jesus, we ask you for this dynamic of the Holy Spirit. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. The, vi- the vindication of the persecuted bride. Chapter 6, 11 to 7, 9. Overview of this passage. In chapter 6, verse 11, she goes down to the garden or to the walnut grove is, is uh, specifically where she's going, or a garden that includes a walnut grove is probably more accurate. She commits herself to serve the whole church. She says, I will go to the garden. I will go where he is in the midst of the people of God, and he'll work together with them. What happens in this session is the second commandment becomes one of the focal dynamics of this passage of Scripture. She says yes to the people dynamics that she walks out more fully in chapter 7. What happens in chapter 6, verse 12, is she's, we'll look at it in a moment, she's overcome with passion for the whole church. In 6.13, a persecution against the bride breaks forth as she seeks to fulfill the Great Commission. There's a divided response in the church. There's a sincere response from one part of the church, and then there's a sarcastic response from another part of the church. The Lord raises up members of the body in chapter 7 who vindicate her, and then later on in chapter 7, verse 6 to 9, the Lord Himself vindicates her in word and in deed. So it's a very different uh, passage of Song of Solomon. Again, it's the people dynamics. It's where she begins to now run in servant ministry in a, in a primary way in her life. The second commandment is being established in its proper place. The mature, her mature commitment to serve the whole church. Incidentally, because the session, uh, like always... It's very long, so we'll, just, we'll skip a number of pages, and then we'll just highlight a, a couple of points, again, to kind of give you a beginning point for your studies. As I've said week by week, this book, the Song of Solomon, is not going to be very beneficial if it's just the memory of a, of a class to where you felt your heart inspired a little bit. This book will only, only be helpful if it, this class inspires you to a diligent study that involves your mind. And then the next step, the turning of what you discover and study into prayerful meditation. This book is not going to uh, uh, be comprehended or become spiritually practical in a meaningful way in, in, in a few months. This is the song of all songs. This is the romance song out of the eternal heart of God. It's not going to be conquered casually or quickly. We're not going to grasp that vastness of God's burning heart quickly. But we posture ourselves in this age and then in the age to come to learn and and for new discoveries forever and forever and forever and forever. I've studied this book with some some diligence for 10 years. And and I'm not saying this in some kind of a hyped up way, but in this session, the 1998 session, I am more overwhelmed at the vastness of this book during this teaching, during this preparation and teaching time than any other time I've taught it. And right now, 1998, I'm looking at it and whole new horizons are, are breaking open before my understanding. And my point being is I go, Lord, I thought I was grasping and the Lord might say you're grasping one of the structures of the book in an introductory way. Yeah. One of the structures of the Holy Spirit you're grasping in an introductory way. Yes, you are grasping it a little bit. Now, spend the rest of your life and throughout eternity beginning to see the implications, the deeper meanings of the implications of this introductory structure. After this last course, I'm, I'm thrown off a bit because it's, it became much bigger than it was after I finished the last course. Somewhere in 1998, the book became bigger. And so now I, I feel... Like, I, I, it's, no, I can't write on it yet. I, it, it got, the book became bigger to me. And I just imagine the whisper of the Lord saying, 
it will forever become bigger to you. Like, Lord, this book is, is that holy agony of heart because the book gets bigger and bigger. It keeps expanding. And the reason is because I'm, I'm uh, uh, some of the language of it has worked its way into my personal private prayer life. And when that happens, the book becomes far bigger. It's true of every book of the Bible, but the romance book in the romantic poetic language it was uh, designed to get bigger as you understand it more. That's the nature of romance. It swallows us up as we get deeper and deeper into it. This book, I believe, by divine design, becomes bigger as we go deeper into it. I, I feel clear about the structure that I've been clear about for a few years, but I feel more overwhelmed. I feel more weak before this book than I've ever felt before. It seems more vast. It seems more transcendent and out of my reach than it has at any other time that I've studied it. And again, I believe that's the nature of divine romance. The deeper you go, the bigger it gets. Amen? Page two. Her mature commitment to serve the whole church. I went down to the garden, to the garden of nuts or to the walnut grove to see the valley, to see the vines and the pomegranates, to see if they've bloomed. The garden in the song. The garden is mentioned nine times in the song. The first three references are to her personal garden, the garden of her heart. The last six references are to his garden. The first three are all hers, her individual heart response The last six is the garden as it's understood as his possession. It's her heart and the heart of all of his people. That's the Lord's garden. The transition, as we know, took place in chapter 4, verse 16. As she goes down to the garden, to the garden of nuts or to the walnut grove, she's explaining to the daughters of Jerusalem, back in chapter 6, verse 2 and 3, how Jesus would be found in the same garden that had beds of spices. As she's telling the garden, uh, the daughters how they can find Jesus in his garden because he's always in the midst of his people. Suddenly, Jesus interrupts her. Chapter 6, verse 4 to 10, which we looked at last week. And now she wants to go down to the garden to join him. She wants to be in the midst of his people Receiving new discoveries of the Lord as she discovers Him among the weak and the strong of the body of Christ. She receives from them and she gives to them. And in the receiving and in the giving and the serving of the weak and the strong of the body of Christ, she encounters, she has new uh, encounters or new discoveries of the beauty of the Lord. That's what Paul the Apostle said in Romans 1, 9. He said, I I want to come to you, the saints at Rome, to be strengthened by your faith, to give and to receive, because he understood that he could encounter the Lord in that in that dialogue, in that two-way encounter, and I mean that giving and receiving from the weak and from the strong in the body of Christ. I have received a number of things from the Lord, from the weak and the immature. When I was ministering to them, the Lord has divine surprises all along the way in terms of discoveries of himself. I give four different characteristics related to the walnut trees. They bring dense shade, therefore refreshing. They're used as a cleansing. They were used for cleansing because they were a main source of oil used in making soap. They they had fragrant leaves that were medicinal and used for healing. They had, in some parts of Israel, they were a significant economic value. They were a an important part of the commercial development of different parts of Israel. The, the walnut industry, uh, industry, because it had so many uses. And of, of course, all, all of these are, uh, can be translated over in a, in a meaningful way. The church is being pictured as a grove of walnuts because of these four dimensions, and I'm sure several more as well. She has the ability to see the vibrant greenness of God's garden, the verdure of the valley. It says here 
in chapter 6, verse 11. Number one, she goes down to see the verdure of the valley, which speaks of the vibrant greenness of the flourishing vegetation. Webster defines this as vibrant, fresh greenness of flourishing vegetation. This speaks of the flourishing work of God. In different places, she has to travel, she has to expend energy and purposefully go to see these other parts of God's garden. Now, there's two parts of God's garden that are being uh, uh, set forth here. Number one, there's the flourishing ministries. Those are the ministries that are in strength. Those are the ministries the Lord has established in a spiritual authority and some kind of maturity. Often these ministries have a certain reputation about them and there's a certain prominence and platform that God gives them. But she not only goes to the verdure of the valley, but she goes to see the budding vines as well. She goes in the midst of the immature budding ministries as well. And she she goes to see these two dimensions of God's church. In other words, she goes to open her heart to them. To see, in chapter 6 verse 11, she goes to see the flourishing and the budding ministries outside of her of her uh, normal course in the body of Christ, her normal geographic place, her familiar course of relationship, she goes, she deliberately goes to see flourishing and to see budding ministries. In chapter 6, 11, she goes to see, in chapter 7, 11, she goes to live, she goes to stay. So in 6, 11, she's positioning her heart for the Holy Spirit to touch her and to impact her with what she sees Again, in seven and six eleven, she sees. In seven eleven, she goes to stay and to uh, and to dwell there. So it's at the very beginning of her commitment. She opens her heart. She says, "Lord, impact me from the larger body of Christ in receiving. I will receive from you in giving from them and receiving from them. I will discover new discoveries of the Lord." Now, one of the problems in the body of Christ is that the The flourishing ministries often intimidate us. Those that are in leadership in the body of Christ, they just depends on the setup. They're they're intimidated by flourishing ministries because they feel insecure and intimidated before their prosperity. But then the budding ministries dismay us because of the immaturity and because of all the mess that's involved with the immature ministries and the things that take place. But she opens her spirit wide to both dimensions. She wants to see whether the vine has budded. This speaks of the immature parts of the work of God. What's happening here is that she's opening her spirit to the larger purpose of God. She's saying yes to a, a, uh, a focused people dynamic in the body of Christ. For the last uh, five chapters, I mean chapter 1 to 6, it's, her heart has been impacted and formed. I mean she's had an interaction, but now she's, she's saying yes in an extravagant way to sacrificial official ministry and service. The foundation is clear in her heart and in her mind. Now don't have the wrong impression that we spend uh, 10 or 15 years out of relationship with people and then one day we have mature relationship. That's not what's going on here. We do both and in every step of our development. But there's a time in our, in our ministries where the Lord begins to release and commission that which He's been training us for for many, many years. And He will train us for ministry while ministering. Typically, the first 10 or 20 years of ministry prepare you for the next 10 or 20 years. There's a, a, a lot of famous statements in the, through lead, from leaders from the body of Christ uh, uh, honoring that principle. Uh, I can think of a number of them where they say it's that last 10 years that their whole life was prepared of 50 years of ministry for the final 10. It's that kind of dynamic. She's now prepared to enter into her life work in the most substantial way. Before I'm even aware, I love this verse, before I'm even aware my soul had made me as the chariots of my noble people. She goes to see the flourishing garden and she goes to see the budding ministries. She's not intimidated by the flourishing ministries in strength. She's not dismayed by the budding ones. 
And the Lord has a divine surprise for her in verse 12. Before she's even aware, there's a divine surprise. The Holy Spirit, if you will, sneaks up on her, ambushes her. He impacts her soul or her heart and transforms it, and she describes it through an imagery that would, have, that, that would be familiar of that day. She goes, my heart becomes like the chariot of the noble people. Something dynamic happens inside of my emotional chemistry. And while she's down in the valley working in the budding vineyards, while she's opening her heart to see the flourishing and the immature ministries, all of a sudden her soul becomes like a chariot of the noble one. This metaphor depicts the zeal that she feels for others. Mature love for the entire church overcomes her. Her soul becomes like a swift chariot. In the ancient world, one could walk or ride a horse, but a chariot was the swiftest way of travel in the ancient world. The chariot was the easiest, fastest way to travel on a long-distance trip. There was no way to move with greater ease or speed than a chariot. A horse can be ridden for several hours, but a chariot can be ridden for many days. The luxury and the ease of a chariot made it the most most, uh, attractive mode of travel in the ancient world. And she says, my heart becomes like this swift moving chariot, but it's more than a chariot. It's the chariot of the noble people. It's not only a chariot, it's the chariot of the noble people. The chariot of a prince are the most excellent and expensive chariots that were known in that day. The most expensive chariots possessed the greatest speed. They traveled with the greatest ease. She says, my soul had made me as the chariots of my noble people. My heart has been transformed. It's moving powerfully with no resistance in a direction and swiftness in a way that surprises me as I go down to view the garden of the Lord, both the flourishing and the budding ministries. In other words, her soul moves swiftly and powerfully with desire for the work of God among the gardens of 611. She moved forward without any resistance whatsoever. This speaks of her being emotionally impacted by the Holy Spirit at the emotional level for the people of God. Before I was even aware, suddenly she she is surprised by the new movement of her heart swiftly going forward to the as she opens her spirit in the new garden. She's not dismayed by the immaturity nor threatened by the prosperity of other ministries. Chapter 6, verse 12, this verse, again, is where the second commandment begins to flourish in her experience. Her heart becomes like a swiftly moving royal chariot before God and before His divine purpose. The Great Commission appears attractive to her instead of intrusive and burdensome. The Great great Commission seems uh, romantic until we begin to actually do it. And then in the doing of active long-term service, we find that the labor has the counterattack of the enemy. It has the ingratitude and the misunderstanding of people. It has the Holy Spirit holds, uh, uh, restrains His power. There's ineffectiveness. There's labor in barrenness on occasion. The Great Commission has its difficulties. And it's a bit romantic on the front end until you've done it for some years and then you find, as as which a number of you have, you find some of the negative dimensions uh, to it. But her heart is captured. It's supernaturally transformed. God is not only pouring love in her, her heart for Jesus, but He's pouring love in her heart for His people and for and giving her endurance to bear the difficulties of the gospel. Paul the Apostle bore more difficulties because of the people who resisted him, both believers and unbelievers, in the work of the ministry. Then he bore difficulties in those that he labored amongst backsliding, or they reject him later, or they refuse his ministry. Second Corinthians chapter, especially 10, 11, and 12, but really the, all of Second Corinthians, is a picture of the difficulties when the Lord begins to anoint his people in the Great Commission. I mean, when it becomes something that becomes the premier occupation of Paul's life, he knew 
He knew prison. He knew persecution. He knew resistance from the people of God. He knew difficulties in his labors. He had all kinds of division and troubles. And he said, Lord, this is, a, this is burdensome. It was a very burdensome thing, his apostolic ministry. She's speaking of her soul being captured by the Spirit of the Lord. The people dynamics are taking place. Philippians chapter 1 is another place like 2 Corinthians where Paul talks about the dynamics involved, the difficulty of people dynamics in, in, the, in the bringing of the gospel to other people. There were the insincere and the false brethren, two different categories. The, uh, I, I mean, there were the insincere, even amongst the, the house of God, who were in the, in the gospel for money. I mean, their ministry was money-driven. And there's the churches filled with uh, men and women like that today, and they're truly born-again people. And they vexed Paul. Paul's heart was, was wearied by them, but he said in Philippians 1, it's better that they're preaching than not preaching. He says, I have found a way in the grace of God to see the good of what's happening in them. It was in that very chapter, Philippians 1, where Paul says, he said, Lord, he said, it's better for me, it's much better for me to die and to be with the Lord. He says, it's much better for me to go on into the celestial city of eternal glory. But he said, I'm going to bear the burdens of ministry for the sake of the young and the immature, of which many of them rose up and resisted him while he was ministering to them. This is a major principle that her soul becomes supernaturally infused with divine passion for the people of God. Again, that sounds romantic until you've actually given yourself in a, in a, in a diligent way to minister. God's people are broken people. God's sheep bite. I've gone to a number of pastors' conferences where, where one of the jokes among the leadership is, they said, well, this guy's burnt out. He has sheep bite. It's kind of a, a, a funny little phrase I've heard over the years. Because it's difficult. We kind of always imagine being anointed and all these grateful, invigorated people standing in line to just receive. It doesn't really happen that way. There's always a little pocket here and there who, who respond that way. But the vast majority, there's a certain tension in the flesh. But her soul becomes supernaturally empowered it becomes invigorated. It moves forward swiftly in the power of God in the most, uh, in the most uh, profound way known in the ancient world, in the chariot, a royal chariot. The second commandment, again, is being established. Another thing that I'm going to add here is in chapter 1, verse 12 to 2, 6, the Lord wants her to sit and eat at the table. Basically, in chapter 1, 12 to 2, 6, his mandate was sit and eat. Listen to worship tapes. Chapter 2, he begins to invite her to the high places. The issue of the high places, rather than just sitting and eating in isolation, becomes the primary thing. It's the high place of revelation. It's the high place, the obstacle that she fears. It's whatever is causing her to draw back from the Lord in fear. He puts his finger on it, the high places in the Lord. He calls her to the high places. In chapter 4, verse 6, remember she goes, I'll go to the mountain of Myrrh. I'll go to the, I'll say yes to the places that my soul has natural resistance to. The high places, the mountaintops. Now here in chapter 6, verse 11, it's the issue of the second commandment. And her soul has become overflowing like the swift moving chariot of, a, of the royal family. She's surprised. She's unaware of what's happening. She opens her heart to these various ministries outside of her her regular place in the body of Christ, and she's overwhelmed as the Lord meets her, calls her heart to himself in that place. Suddenly her enthusiasm moves like a chariot as she experiences deep feelings for other parts of the purpose of God. This is a unique and supernatural gift to have a heart like a swiftly moving chariot for the people of God. Again, for those that have very little leadership experience, that may not sound like a big deal. That's a massive, that's a significant and rare uh, work of the Holy Spirit in the heart of God's leaders. One of the great characteristics of the end time church is zeal for the whole church. The soul of the bride will be swift to move forward in love and concern and desire for the other parts of the church, the, the flourishing and the immature. 
Historically, people usually support and honor and have patience only for what they own. It's true right now all over the body of Christ. Where mostly we have energy and excitement for what we own, what is ours. We talk much in the leadership principles. In the discussion of leadership principles, we talk much about ownership as necessary before God's people become enthusiastic about a ministry. This is a true principle. People do have to have ownership. However, usually it refers to ownership in our own small local sphere of ministry. Jesus wants his bride to have ownership in the whole church and not only the small little part that's under her authority or close to her. You go to uh, 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 present the cause of, of another ministry and the issue is to get the people to feel ownership about it. And the question that's always brought up, well, how will this ultimately make us happier? It's always the issue. And the Lord's work of the Holy Spirit is, and He still operates by the principle of ownership, but He gives her the revelation of her ownership over the whole body of Christ because it's His bride and she is fully His. She begins to see the people who don't contribute to her earthly ministry as valuable to Jesus and a significant part of what's on his heart. And it's that revelation of ownership that gets a hold of her heart. And I believe that God's going to have many leaders in the, in the end day church whose heart is like a swiftly moving chariot for spheres of ministry that they don't own or have authority over simply because it's God's church. Now, it's very common to hear the rhetoric about it, but it's not, it's not, it's not a, a, a spiritual reality of, a very much at this point in time. But chapter 6, verse 12 is going to be a reality before this thing is over. God is going to let us see the other parts of the garden, and our hearts will move swiftly and suddenly towards them in a way that surprises us. It's the very work of God. It's called the second commandment. It's God loving His people through our own hearts. The Lord is raising up a people that will have an enlarged heart, like Paul the Apostle. In other words, they'll have a heart that cares about the Lord's purpose, regardless of the immaturities that are a part of it, or who governs it, or what place that it's in. The problem is that the other parts of the church don't do things like we do things. They don't have the same burden, they don't have the same emphasis, they don't have the same style, but they have the same God. Now we're all familiar with this concept. But emotionally, the heart of God's church right now is not connected to the body of Christ. God is raising up a multitude of shepherds that love the whole church, including the immature ministries that do things different, that are still immature, the budding vines. It's easy to receive a mature prophet or a seasoned teacher, but it is the young and stumbling ministries in the body of Christ they're still working through unbalanced ideals with unrealistic emphasis. And God wants to raise up a father heart in both men and women that can oversee the, the uh, unbalances and the, and the uncomely dimensions of their ministries. I'm always hearing about a new ministry emerging. Over in this part of the land or this country, there's this New group of young people, and I, I mean, so regularly I hear God's servants talk. Not all of them, but it's a very common a sentiment. Yeah, but they're pretty really off on this one deal. And it's like, of course they're off on this one thing. They're new budding vineyards. They're new budding vines, of course. They're not seasoned and, and mature and complicated. Typically, in their untempered zeal, they have pride and an exaggerated self, uh, sense of their self-importance. That's all part of budding ministries. God's raising up men and women with a father's heart, a shepherd's heart. They can see through all of that. And they say, we understand that. But we see what's in your spirit and who you are in the Lord. And we know you're going to cause a little mess. But when this thing settles and lands over the, in the next decade or two, you're going to really have some substantial fruit to offer others. It's a very significant part of the book. Again, chapter 7 and 8 is, is mostly about leadership. Chapters 7 and 8 is about the leadership dynamics, the apostolic dynamics of bringing the gospel to others. 
And though that's not where most people are living right now, most people are living in chapter 1 to 4, but 7 and 8 are a significant part of the progression into holy passion. And so if you're not just living there just now, just remember it. Say, yeah, I'm going to search that out. It's apostolic leadership and the, and the ways that God's servants go forward in the power of God is what's going on here. One thing we're going to look at next week is that God wants His people to remain in a position of weakness when they feel the power of God on them. We'll look at that in chapter 8, verse 5. When she's coming up out of the wilderness, leaning on her beloved, she, she deliberately continues in a place of weakness while feeling the power of God. She chooses as a mature response to remain in a place of weakness. And one of the, most, the greatest uh, errors that leaders commit, that I commit, that other leaders commit, when we feel the power of God, we take it a step further further and we begin to operate in strength. We begin to exert our will and we begin to enter into, we'll look at some of the dynamics next week, but we enter into a human strength dynamic because we feel the power of God. When God would have us live in voluntary weakness while feeling power. And that's a, that's a mark of maturity. Paul the Apostle operated in that. The powerful ministries can command everyone to come and go or they'll give the word out and censor them and destroy them because of their towering influence and prominence. The Lord wants men and women of God with divine authority who are restrained and tempered and living in voluntary weakness while feeling the power of God on their soul. And that's a, it's a very rare operation of the Holy Spirit. These are some of the principles in chapter 7 or 8, these apostolic dynamics of leadership. Again, most of uh, the folks in the room here are in chapter 1 to 4, and that's where the Lord wants us. I love this again. The Lord's raising up a multitudes of shepherds that will love the whole church. They won't be threatened by the flourishing, and they won't be dismayed by the budding and the immature. They give them room and space. They have energy for the young and the immature who are going to cause hassle and won't really contribute much to their ministries. She's not impatient or angry with the newly blooming pomegranates or the newly budding vines. Some are easily exasperated with new ministries. Because again, they not only do it wrong, they do it wrong with pride. They do it wrong with pride, with tremendous youthful energy and zeal. They can outrun anybody because they're young and they got lots of energy. So they're not only doing it with wrong ideas, with pride, with lots of energy. The Lord says, that's how I ordained it. Give them room and give them space and see them like I saw you. And I have those principles written here in the notes. I'm just kind of summing up where uh, you'll find a lot of these principles uh, scattered throughout the pages here. It's easy to receive them to a prophet or a seasoned teacher, but it's the young and the stumbling. They're still working through unbalanced ideas with unrealistic emphasis. The problem is compounded because these ministries do, in fact, cause disturbance. And they promote themselves while they're doing it. But that's how young ministries go forward. That's how Paul the Apostle grew. We have this idea that he just came out of the spiritual womb, mature. No! He was a zealous Messing up everything he touched, struggled with self-promotion, young guy at one time. I promise you, the bride's heart is like overwhelming. It's my soul is like a swift moving chariot. I'm overwhelmed. She goes, I was taken by surprise. I went down to see these ministries and God imparted God's heart for the church to me. Oh, I love it when we open our hearts to see the other ministries, not to evaluate them. Not to figure out how we can use them, but to see them like God sees them. And when we open our hearts to see them, the flourishing and the struggling and immature budding ones, we open our heart to see God touches our heart and gives us that divine enthusiasm. Again, we don't see them to criticize them, to evaluate them, to figure out how we can use them, to figure out how we can dismiss them, but to see them in the Spirit like God sees them in their imperfections. And what happens is that the, the daughters of Jerusalem cry out, Return, return, O Shulamite, return, that we may look upon you. The daughters express their desire to seek the Lord with her. 
Back in chapter 6, verse 1, they said, we want to seek Jesus with you. That was in chapter 6, verse 1. Now here in 6, 13, she goes to these, the, the, the garden to go see the other ministers. They go, wait, come back. What about us? We don't want you anointed to go out there. We want you to just take care of us. They loved her ministry because of the fragrance of Christ was with her. However, she wanted to be with the Lord. The Lord, in terms of her particular experience at this time, the Lord was in the gardens of His church across the earth, and He wanted her with Him. She wanted to be with the Lord. And it happened to be that He was serving in the gardens. The daughters expressed their desire. They said, we want to seek the Lord with you. Don't you remember? We're saying yes to you right now. Teach us your ways. Return, return, O Shulamite. She left the daughters to go down to the garden to help others. The sincere daughters urgently request her to return. In Acts 20, the elders of Ephesus wept because Paul had to leave them to go to other parts of the Lord's vineyard or the Lord's garden. It describes them as meeting Paul at the ship and sobbing and weeping and saying, please stay. And he says, no, that's a, an example in the book of Acts, where in the perfect will of God, Paul had to move on. There's a tension that's going on here. The daughters are very desirous of more of her ministry. We want to look upon you. The repetition of the word return four times by the daughters in this verse communicates their urgency and desire to hear her and to come uh, and to have her come back to them. That we may look upon you. We want to see you. They want to follow her example as she follows the Lord is what's going on. We want to follow the Lord as you're following the Lord. They have been impacted by her life. They want to look upon her with the amazement that Paul the Apostle describes in 1 Corinthians 4. It's a very interesting verse. Paul the Apostle says, God has exhibited anointed apostles as a spectacle to both men and angels. That God put anointed apostles in the, in the show window, put them on display, and the angels and humans gazed on them, and they were a spectacle, an amazement to both angelic and to human realms. As they looked upon these anointed apostles, I believe that one of the reasons that they're amazed is at the dedication of the anointed apostles, the mature apostle. In Acts 14, in Lystra, when Paul was stoned, they left him for dead. He didn't actually die, but the people of Lystra thought he was dead. He was bruised and bloodied. However, it should say soon after, we don't know if it was that day, but soon after, Paul went back into the city to preach to the very people that stoned him. I can imagine the angel saying, where did that dedication come? I mean, Paul's beaten and, and stoned. And they said, he's surely dead. He walks back buddy, bloodied and beaten. He says, Christ Jesus is the way. And they're going, what is the deal with this man? His soul had become like the chariot of the noble ones. He was overwhelmed. He was filled with God-imparted zeal and compassion for the people of God. They want to look upon her. There's so much they can learn from her. I believe right in the middle of the verse, there's another response. It's a sarcastic response from the very same church. Two responses from the one church of Jesus. This is in the middle of the verse. They they answer back to the daughters, what would you see in the Shulamite, as it were, the dance of the two camps? I believe that this is a sarcastic response. They go, we want to look, we want to look at her. And they, 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 a group rises up to challenge the group that wants to look on the Shulamite, saying, what exactly is it you want to see when you gaze at her? They're challenging the request to look upon her. And some interpreters think it's a positive challenge like a statement of wonder, like, wow, show us what you see in her, and others see it as a negative challenge, and that's how I see it. What is it that you want to see in her that you're so urgent to imitate her faith and to follow her life in God? The watchman who struck her earlier in chapter 5, verse 7, I believe are the ones with a sarcastic response. 
Because just a chapter earlier, she was put under discipline and censored and excommunicated out of the body of Christ. The watchman took her covering and her veil and put her out. And they, and they're, I believe it's this group, though I can't prove it, but it seems uh, 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 simple and logical. that the, the group that put her out in chapter 5 is the group challenging the desire to imitate her. What is it that you want to see in her? As it were, the dance of the two camps. This is the dance of spiritual warfare, the dance of two camps. The two camps, or the two armies, as the King James says, or the two companies, the New American Standard says, or the camp of Mahanium, the NIV says. Mahanium was a town where Jacob was pursued by his older brother Esau. The key biblical incident that happens in this town. The conflict started when Jacob stole Esau's birthright by deceiving their father Isaac. Jacob defi- divided his, two, his company of people into two camps, into two groups at Mahanaim. So that when Esau, his brother, who was pursuing him and caught up with him at this town... Jacob divided his, his people into two camps so that Esau, when he caught them, he could only destroy one of them. One would go north, the other would go south. It was a city that spoke of the conflict of what was happening. While running from Esau, Jacob experiences a visitation of God, and the angels of the Lord appear to him, and Jacob's ladder, he has the vision of Jacob's ladder ascending and descending. You can read it all in Genesis chapter 32. So it's a place where the the great historic conflict took place. I believe it speaks of conflict, angelic visitation, the move of God, all of these dynamics, and I have them summed up here in the paragraphs here, taking place in the city. The Hebrew word mehanim can be translated to camps, to armies, to companies, or it can simply be translated as the name of the city, mehanim. Most scholars are not sure if the word is referring to the city or it should be translated as the two camps of the two armies. I believe it's both and. I believe that what happened is that the gaze upon the anointed bride, one group responds with great urgency, the other group draws back in criticism and division. I believe that it's the place of conflict where the angels of the Lord are manifest and the intervention of God takes place. It's a word play. The very city for which these events occurred becomes a symbol and a picture of the conflict. It was a city known for its conflict and the divine visitation and the appearance of angels concerning the inheritance of the Lord. So I believe it's a word picture. I believe it speaks of the city, and it speaks of the two camps for which the city is a symbol of. It's a picture of. There's a division that breaks forth when the bride goes forth. She goes forth under a new anointing. There's there's a new resolve. It's that the hour of the Lord is upon her, and when God begins to raise up His apostles and prophets in a new level, there will be disruption. There will be the dance of the two camps wherever they go. The dance speaks of the interaction of the two parties. The dance of the two camps or the interaction of the two different groups within the body of Christ. In this case, it's a negative interaction. It's a dance of spiritual warfare. It's an interaction between the forces in the realm of the spirit, demons and angels. It's it's an interaction between the forces in the realm of the natural. The sincere for the Lord and those that resist the word of the Lord even in the midst of the organized church. The divisive interaction between the two camps is represented by Saul attacking David. There are the Saul and the David kind of people in the body of Christ right now. Spiritual warfare is often manifest as division in the human arena as jealous people attack godly people inside of the organized church. We've seen it all through history. The Lord has always allowed Jacob and Esau to dwell together. He's always allowed the Saul's and the David's to have a season together or to dwell together for a season. 
He uses the Esau's to train the Jacob's. He uses the Saul's to train the David's in righteousness. The interaction between the two camps. It is an interaction between the two camps that are even in the body of Christ to this day, in this day, in this hour. But the Lord will bring the church to unity and maturity out of this context. There will be division before there is substantial unity. Some people don't like that. The Lord is going to raise up the standard. And the mature and the immature that have a sincere heart, the mature and the immature with a sincere heart will flock to the standard of the Lord. There will be those in the organized church that will detest the standard that God raises up. It's a standard of righteousness that He's calling His people to abandonment. That's going to cause uneasiness and disruption. When a million people begin to live, when a million people in the Western world, let's narrow it, begin to live in a literal way in the first commandment in first place, it will cause disruption. Because the people who don't want to live with the first commandment in first place are going to have opinions about those that do want to live that way. And those that do want to live that way will typically be new at it, and so they'll say it wrong with a little bit of spiritual pride just to complicate the whole equation. For Jesus came to bring division between the sincere and the insincere, not between the mature and the immature. The mature and the immature have the, in the body of Christ that have a fervent spirit are equally yoked. A mature apostle and a brand new believer that have a yes in their spirit are equally yoked. Equally yoked is an issue of the yes in the spirit. The division is going to be between the sincere and the insincere in the organized church. The inevitable clash that shows up in the book of Acts and the gospel through all Christian history. It's the division between the sincere and the insincere. Those that are content with business as usual Christianity, they don't want their religious world disrupted. This is where the dance of the two camps is going to manifest in the human arena. It will have a manifestation in the spiritual arena as well as the powers, the supernatural powers. There's a conflict, angels and demons and the word of the Lord going forth, but there's a human manifestation of it too. I mean, a manifestation in the human arena. This is where the watchmen say, what do you see in the Shulamite? What would you see in her is what they're asking. It's a sarcastic question. These watchmen don't want her exhortations to purity and holiness to have center stage. Another word for holiness is wholehearted lovers. It's the first commandment in first place. That's another way of saying holiness unto the Lord. Those who resist passion for God and holiness feel challenged by the bride with her clear, her clear call to abandonment. Holiness may be, it is unpopular in some parts of the church, but it will never be unpopular with God or with the Holy Spirit, the one who is holy. The clash is the clash of holiness and passion with God, for God in the midst of the end time church. And that clash is in, is in the making right now. There will be leaders in God's church and even sincerely born again believers. They call holiness legalism. They call it unnecessary. They call it ridiculous. They call it why bother with all of this abandonment stuff. Enter into your liberty. It's those that confuse the understanding of the grace of God. What happens now in chapter 7, 1 to 5, is that God raises up the church, the discerning saints, to vindicate her in the midst of the accusing watchmen. And there's ten statements they say to her. And I believe that these ten statements, it's significant that a chapter earlier, I mean chapter 5, she spoke ten statements about the Lord in chapter 5, remember? Now the Lord raises up the church, the immature, the immature daughters, who speak ten statements about her beauty as she spoke to the daughters about the Lord's beauty two chapters earlier. The Lord raised up part, before, the Lord raised up part of the church to stand with the bride. Eventually the whole church will be unified before the Lord comes. But there's going to be 
There's going to be a dance of two camps before this thing is unified. There's going to be some conflict, but the conflict will be part of God's strategy to purify the bride. The bride will learn righteousness in the conflict of carnal believers. I hear people say all the time, they go, we got to pray that, oh, so-and-so, the Lord would take his voice away. He's causing so much division. I go, I don't have energy for that. You can. I go ahead. Go for it. But the problem is when God takes that guy's voice away or that person's voice away, the Lord will allow ten more to be raised up because God, the church, hath need of this conflict to grow in love and wisdom and meekness and purity. I said, these people that are accusing any number of us at any time, those accusations actually are part of the Lord's strategy to purify us and to get us to live with an identity in the Lord instead of our identity before people. The Lord over, overrules these accusations and actually uses them. I said, I'm not worried about the people who say God's servants are evil and wicked and demonic. I said, don't worry about it. The Lord knows the score. He, he's using this thing to wean our own hearts and to cause us to be deeply established in wisdom and passion for the Lord. Anyway, we have a, 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 quite a few pages on these ten, attri- these ten attributes. This is one of my favorite ones. I only got to have a minute. It's the principle of the king being held captive by her dedication. (laughs) I only have two or three minutes and we need to finish this one. But again, you have to read the notes or study it. This is a, this is only a menu. Now the Lord himself vindicates her. The Lord comes in after the, he raised up members of the body of Christ to speak and stand for her. Now he stands for her. And he, this chapter 7, verse 6 to 9, is parallel to last week's chapter 6, verse 4 to 10. It is one of those very intense, extravagant communications of the Lord's heart. Chapter 4, verse 9 to 15. Chapter 6, verse 4 to 10, and chapter 7, verse 6 to 9, those are the three dynamic, extravagant statements of God's heart. I mean, it is fantastic. 4, chapter 4, verse 9 to 15, chapter 6, verse 4 to 10, chapter 7, verse 6 to 9. These are passages you really want to be connected with and live by. Having said that, we'll end the session. (laughs) Amen, let's stand. Again, my goal is always to hook you up to this. I want you to leave saying, i got to study that. I don't even know what it is, but just the way he was smiling, I I know there's something there. Again, it takes weeks and months and even years. And the deeper we go, the bigger the book gets. Father, we ask you to draw our hearts. Let us see the garden of the Lord. Let us have the revelation of our ownership of the whole church. Because we own your heart and you own our heart. We can rejoice with the prospering members of the body and not be threatened. And we can have patience and endurance the budding vines that cause trouble and, and even expend the resources of the church while they're growing. Lord, let us see your heart, that we could feel ownership, that our heart would come and we would be even unaware as you would capture and take us like a swiftly moving chariot into your heart. Oh, make our heart like that, Lord. Lord, as the dance of the two camps breaks out, I ask that the issues of chapter 7 that we just abbreviated, you would minister to us in the time of persecution. You would minister to our hearts in the time of persecution and from chapter 7 as you minister to our hearts from chapter 5 in the time of attesting before you when your presence lifts. Come and feed our spirit from chapter 7. In the time of persecution, we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. This concludes this tape presentation from Friends of the Bridegroom. 
For more information on resources available from Mike Bickle, as well as news about upcoming conferences and live broadcasts, visit our website at www.fotb.com. Thank you.